Good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University, a webinar series funded by the USDA Forest Service. My name is Robin Osborne and I'm coming to you from Michigan State University. Along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from The Ohio State University and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, we welcome you to today's presentation that is an overview of how the state of Maryland's planning and coordination efforts in both rural and urban areas helped it to develop its EAB management priorities. Our presenters for this presentation are Ann Hairston Strang and Colleen Kenny from the Maryland Forest Service. Ann is the Acting Associate Director for Maryland Forest Service and oversees the Emerald Ash Borer and Watershed Forestry Projects and coordinates with the Maryland Department of Agriculture for forest health issues. She has been with the MFS Watershed Forestry Program since 1997. Colleen Kenny is the Emerald Ash Borer Forester for the Maryland Forest Service and she coordinates statewide planning, outreach, and response. She has been with the MFS since August of 2015. Before we get started, I want to remind you that we welcome your comments and questions. Please feel free to write them in the question and answer feature, and which will you can find by either mousing over the bottom or sometimes over the top of your screen. We will be making a note of all the questions and we'll have our presenters respond to the questions after the presentation has ended. To keep these free webinars coming, we will need your feedback. There will be a link provided to you in the Q&A pod at the end of the webinar for a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. If you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag. But we hope you'll give us feedback either way. I will be sending out an email after the webinar with the link in case you weren't able to access it during the webinar. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to Amy Stone at stone.91 at osu.edu. I also put that information in the chat feature here on the webinar. Amy will be sending out certificates within a week of today's program. This webinar is being recorded and you will be, uh, it will be available for viewing soon at www.emerald-board.info. You will also find the recordings for all our previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you so much for attending today and Anne, please unmute your microphone and you can now share your screen with your presentation. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to, to share our experiences uh, here in, in Maryland. Um, it is, uh, I think everybody's familiar with the really devastating impacts of Emerald Ash Borer. Um, and we learned a lot from looking around at uh, what had been happening in other states and one of the things I, I hope people come away with is sort of the understanding of how, how beneficial it is to be able to have that, that transfer of information and how it helps us um, manage some of the really horrible impacts uh, of this exotic invasive insect. And I know that we know that we're going to need to be prepared for more of its uh, cousins and brethren uh, down, down the road. So we appreciate the, the learning opportunities that this contributes to. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the background, you know, our particular situation and what we had to respond to in terms of you know, management and priority setting. And then I'll go into some of the details of uh, the, the progress and, and results and then talk about future plans. So we got Emerald Ash Borer um, in one location. Ed's Plant World in 2003 um, was filling its ash tree order. Um, they ordered out of Tennessee, and that nursery uh, didn't have quite enough to fill that order. They got some from a nursery in Michigan outside the quarantine zone at the time. 
and that nursery had some shipped from one of its other locations inside the quarantine zone. And those are the trees that arrived uh, at Ed's plant world and that one of our nursery inspectors, MDA nursery inspectors found uh, that summer. And at the time, it, it was a very one isolated instance and we thought we had a really good shot at eradication. And so we started, you know, the best available information that we, you know, we could get from, you know, what we knew, you know, what people knew about the biology of the bug at the time is that, you know, it didn't usually travel more than half a mile. So the little green triangle in the middle of the screen is where the initial uh, infestation was. And so there was a whole lot of work that Maryland Department of Agriculture and APHIS and Maryland DNR Forest Service did in trying to remove ash trees from that entire inner green circle. Uh, and MDA set up trap trees and monitored it uh, for three years. And then in 2006, if you see that little red dot right outside of the, the inner green circle, we found that emerald ash borers, when hungry, flew just more than half a mile. And so from there, we were still in eradication mode and we were, you know, but you can see those concentric circles and how, how quickly the area grows as you try and um, encompass uh, a, a spreading population from that, from that single point of, of infestation. And so by 2007, it had, was just growing rapidly and you know, beyond a lot of the capacity of our resources. And by 2008, you can see just the scale getting bigger and bigger. And by 2009, it had you know, not, it, it, eradication like everywhere else that it, it has been tried um, did not work in Maryland, even though I think we probably had you know, a, a situation that if it could be controlled, that, that it was most likely to be controlled. And so there was a whole lot of effort that went into that over six years. Um, and what we've ended up with at the end of it, even though, uh, you know, by, by 2009, um, there was a lot of infestations that had been discovered in surrounding states. And it was clearly you know, on, on, on the move and eradication was not going to be a possibility. But it, it bought us, you know, almost 10 years of being at the point where we are now with, with the infestation spreading rapidly across the state. So in 2009, we changed the focus from eradication to containment. And that's the point at which we sat down and looked at all of the partners, tried to find all the partners that were contributing um, you know, expertise and actions and, and involvement and interest and form the interagency committee. So I'm, I'm not going to go down and you know, read, read the whole list, but suffice it to say that there's a lot of different uh, agencies and, and uh, organizations that are affected by this and can contribute to effective management of it. And what we ended up with uh, over the course of, well, by the time we got the committee together uh, and developed the long-term plan with support from U.S. Forest Service, uh, was uh, 2011 that we had a draft. I uh, wanted to mention that we really looked hard at all the resources that were available at the time for from U.S. Forest Service at, at some guidance out there. Uh, their uh, forest health folks were really good about pointing us to where there were some good examples of community response plans and, and outreach and biocontrol options. Uh, and so we, you know, you learned so much from that as we were, you know, sort of doing zero to 60 in terms of, you know, having to deal with it in the upcoming years. So in that long-term plan, uh, we, we basically followed a lot of the U.S. Forest Service guidance on that. And so we looked at you know, what's the status of emerald ash borer in the state? You know, what, you know, who, who 
who's got what roles and what responsibilities, how do we need to work together, uh, and where for Maryland are our, our biggest risks, and what, you know, in the face of, you know, 99% mortality, are our options for, you know, getting uh, the best possible uh, outcome uh, despite the, uh, the, the known adverse impacts. And so the, the result of that, that plan was, well, the, the places where we probably had the biggest public health and safety concerns and the most opportunity to treat them is, is in our communities and urban areas. And so we really you know the initial focus was on our street trees and communities. So where we are close to now um, is that the, the, the central part of our state is the most developed part. Um, and you can see the, the cluster of a lot of the positive EAB fines right around there in Prince George's County. You can also see a cluster out in Western Maryland. Uh, and that's where it moved along the I-81 corridor and it was in Allegheny County, um, you know, not, not too long after we were getting it spreading rapidly in Prince George's County. And uh, as of 2014, the entire uh, part of the state that was west of the Chesapeake Bay was in the, the Great Big Quarantine. Um, in 2015, we uh, the Department of Agriculture was continuing its survey work and they found and were asked for in several different locations, unfortunately. So we had hoped to have a couple more years before it, it moved onto the eastern shore, but it is there now. Delaware is still uh, has not found signs of emerald ash borer. It was also moving rapidly up in north through Baltimore County. And so we are now uh, solidly in the middle of the, the great big quarantine. Um, prior to the, the, the great big quarantine that, that allows movement within that quarantine area, some of our ash market had gotten very, very limited. In, in Maryland, we're not a big ash producing state to begin with. The markets are relatively small and, and people that mostly backed away from it. Um, and so with the, the with APHIS moving to the Great Big Quarantine, it has helped our ash markets be a, a little more available uh, so that we have more options for removals uh, if the situation allows for that. A uh, little bit more about, you know, what our risks are in, in Maryland. Uh, we have, you know, probably a lower amount of ash than many of the lake states. So we have less exposure, but it's still millions of trees. And one of the things that you know, we realize, even though the overall number is, is not that large, there are some areas where there are fairly pure ash stands and they're in areas that have a, a particular concerns for, for water quality. One of the things that we've done recently is take some of our natural heritage data and they were able to, to pull out the denser stands. And it was, as we looked at this map, we're like, okay, those are our, our big wetlands and riparian corridors. And that's where our highest ash densities tend to be uh, and where they will have uh, more direct water quality concerns. So we're, we're looking at white and green ash being pretty common across most of Maryland, white more in Western Maryland. We have several rare species that we have had concerns about and would like to you know, make sure that we continue. That's black ash uh, more in Western Maryland and pumpkin and Carolina ash more on the Eastern shore and in the coastal part.
this map shows some of the, the species distribution. So you can see the, the green ash you know, clustering in our riparian areas and wetlands, the white ash being a little more in the upland. This isn't all of the ash in the state. This is just where we have our uh, natural heritage plots, where we do our vegetation community descriptions, where we have very detailed species. So one of the issues that we have for Maryland, because we are you know, at the heart of the, the Chesapeake Bay region, it is some of the water quality concerns. And that made us particularly interested in making sure we tried to find the best available outcome for, for our state. Um, and we're, we're, this is one of the issues that we're still trying to, to figure out how we address sufficiently. Um, one of the real concerns is some of the extensive stands along our, our uh, large floodplains that, that do eventually feed into the Chesapeake Bay. And these are particularly challenging for management. Uh, these are often the locations where we have some of the rare species that we'd like to make sure are represented into the future. The stands are in, entirely too large to, to treat effectively uh, across the stand. And they also tend to be really, really wet and hard to access and treat. So our initial focus, you know, because of the, the higher risk to public health and safety, was in our urban and community areas. Uh, we do have ash as a pretty common landscaping species, both on the uh, street trees and in, and in backyards. Some of our jurisdictions, uh, Baltimore City estimates that they have about 10% of their street trees as, as ash. And the challenges for ash management include just, this is not an issue that the people go home at the end of the day and then generally worry about or know about. So there's there's a lot to, that, it's, that it takes to get people's attention. Um, and so we've had a lot of partners uh, from the you know, Department of Agriculture and Maryland Extension Service and counting on like uh, the APHIS, Stone of Wood kind of advertising. We're, we're trying to not, not duplicate things, but work together pretty effectively to, to get as much coverage as we can. And we're always, of course, like everybody, running up against uh, funding issues uh, most of us have, have been having to you know, cut back and uh, make some tough choices about what, what we fund and don't fund. And this is you know, coming into that environment as yet another priority that needs a very, very quick response. So one of the things that we did after we had our long-term plan and said, okay, you know, here, here we are, we're trying to bring all of our resources to bear that we have, and we we know that we can't do a lot of what we would like to do. Uh, so we were able to, through the U.S. Forest Service Northeastern Area, the competitive grant process, we were able to uh, secure uh, two years of funding to really get out and try and get out in front of this as much as possible on the community planning real emphasis on that, although we, we were trying to have some elements in there for uh, rural forests and stewardship planning as well. So we were, the, the first thing that we needed to do for planning is, is urban tree inventory. Most of our jurisdictions did not have urban tree in, inventories, uh, unlike some states. We've been focusing on Arbor Day uh, programs, Earth Day plantings, that sort of thing. But we uh, really needed a lot of work on urban tree inventory. And this really helped us get started in a lot of places. And it also let us uh, produce some materials that are, were really needed for education and outreach and do some initial treatments uh, while we had the opportunity in these areas where we were working with the communities. We also used the, uh, the funding to get started on utilization options. Thinking you know, the Emerald Ash Borer with the, the expected increase in dead tree removals, 
who wanted to be in a better position to have better utilization in our urban areas. We wanted to do it in a way that informed the, the larger picture of, because there's always better utilization for some of these urban wood and storm debris, uh, those kind of options. So we're trying to see what we can do to not only help in this you know, next couple of years as we're dealing with a lot of dead tree removals, but how can we better build our, our state capacity to, to handle disasters into the future? And we have across our, our, our staff and trying to educate ourselves and so that we are passing on good advice to our uh, rural forest landowners and having them being able to capture what value they can without uh, hurting future stand conditions. So I've been mentioning partnerships and I just wanted to take a moment and, and really acknowledge that this, this is really critical to being able to progress on this. Um, Maryland Department of Agriculture has, has been our, our lead in Maryland for a lot of forest health, health issues for a long time. They continue to be you know, our mainstay for all of the forest health survey work. Um, Maryland Forest Service doesn't have that expertise on staff. Uh, and so we really rely on them to, to do that. But then Maryland Department of Agriculture wasn't staffed to be able to have foresters in every county that may be able to help communicate with some of these issues. So it's that that kind of coordination that's really essential to being able to, to make progress. So this is just a, a list of some of the, the, the roles and responsibilities that we had with our different partners. University of Maryland Extension uh, was absolutely instrumental in a lot of the early outreach that got some of our jurisdictions interested and active. Uh, there was a, uh, one of the, the workshops, they brought in uh, people from cities in, in Michigan that shared some of the, their experience and some of the devastating impact on their communities and on their budgets and on their ability to, to manage public health and safety and some of the liability issues. And that was really effective as a wake up call uh, to, to some of our jurisdictions that had, had some exposure in that. They are, University of Maryland uh, is also critical for our, our outreach to arborists and other folks there are doing research on the spread, the susceptibility, uh, control measures, and they are very much part of our uh, system for um, handling biocontrol, you know, particularly monitoring it after the releases. Uh, obviously, the biocontrol, you know, we are one, one partner and just taking advantage of that you know, larger network uh, that's doing the research and the production of the biocontrols that allows us to release and monitor. I think I mentioned before, APHIS, obviously they, they funded most of that initial eradication work that bought us enough time to where we, we have more, more options, more information, more access to biocontrol once the, the bug has, has hit our state. And we count on their, their continuing programs for, for things like don't move firewood, beetle detective. Uh, and U.S. Forest Service, we continue to partner with uh, you know, for a lot of technical guidance and advice and you know, pointing us to useful places that, that we should be learning from. And they have provided some, you know, most of the funding that's allowed us to um, really have somebody dedicated to this issue and make the kind of progress that you'll see in just a minute. And our uh, local jurisdictions are a, a key partner. And you'll see some examples here in a minute. So the community response plans, I mean, we basically just borrowed a, a model from some of the states that, have, that have had to already work through these issues, uh, which was excellent to have that available. 
as I said before, the tree inventory was, was job one. How much ash do you even have? How much exposure do you have? And just help jurisdictions work through, okay, what are your priorities? What do you want to man manage? What's going to be cost effective for your situation, whether it's best to, to treat and or remove and replace? And are there ways to be able to utilize some of the material that's coming out? And how do you let your citizens know about it and understand what's going on and some of their street trees are being being removed? And making sure people are clear about who's who's going to do what part of that. So one of the, the first calls that we got after our Emerald Ashbourne Forester, our first one, Tyler Wakefield, we got a call and well, Plato was like, we, we got a call from a citizen and they think they have Emerald ash borer. And so Tyler went down there and sure enough, they, they definitely had Emerald ash borer. This is uh, near uh, one of the cities near the initial introduction. And that community where we got the call from had almost pure ash street trees that were very young. They were probably planted about the time that uh, we found emerald ash borer in the United States. Uh, and so we, we did a high tree based uh, in inventory, sampled most of the, uh, some street segments throughout the city, but did 100% inventory on those communities where we knew we had a high ash cover. Uh, so some of them had already uh, died and they were, were being removed. The, the city looked at its situation that you know, outside of those younger trees and those newer communities, it didn't have uh, a, a lot of loss that it would expect. And they, they chose to, to do removal and replacement rather than try and do a lot of treatment on these younger trees, knowing that they would have to, to retreat into the future. Next, we moved out to, to Cumberland. And again, there was relatively few ash street trees. Um, and with the inventory data that, that were collected, they were able to identify ash that were in good conditions, didn't have utility conflicts, looked like they were flourishing and, and worthy of treatment. By the time that we started lining up treatment uh, in, in the fall, some of them were already showing signs of severe infestation, even though they had looked healthy in the inventory just a few months before. Um, and as on a side note, one of the uh, when they were getting together partners to discuss the, the local situation, they coordinated with the National Park Service. And although Cumberland itself didn't have that many ash uh, street trees, the Park Service had a lot of that land, the CNO Canal Park along the, the Potomac River, and they had lots of ash trees down there, the young green ash. And so they've had to deal with with that situation in, in a very different way than the street trees. So we were able to get some, some treatments on some of the surviving street trees in, in Cumberland in, in that, that window of opportunity out there has now passed. Uh, similarly, Allegheny uh, County Fairgrounds outside of the city uh, had some trees where this was like the, the ash tree shade was the only place that was really comfortable and hanging out at the fairgrounds for the, the county fair. And it was a really important resource to the people. Again, there was some decline in some of the trees before they were able to get treated, but some of them were able to get treated. That's going to make a difference to the folks in that county for years to come. Um, similarly, in Bakerstown, that, again, out in Western Maryland, where it's been, been moving through. They looked at their situation and they said, you know, our, our most critical resource here is the trees in our, our city park. We have some just wonderful trees right near a lot of places where people use. There would be a lot of hazard if these died. Um, and we would we really change the experience in the city park. Some of those were able to, to get treated uh, ahead of uh, damage on that. And that's going to make a difference 
for quite a while to come. Uh, Anne Arundel County was their staff was one of the folks that attended one of the extension workshop and got the wake up call. And they they took the initiative to develop their own response plan uh, with the, not not too much input from from or assistance from us. Uh, uh, and they've also been an excellent partner as we were developing an option for volunteer-based inventory. You know, we were trying to get done what we could with the field staff that we had, but there's a lot of area in the state, and Anne Arundel County is a pretty, pretty developed county, and most of it, there's a lot of street trees. So we were able to uh, build on a model where the uh, a high school that specialized in some STEM education was looking for service learning credit hours. And so we were able to provide them with their service learning credit hours and we gave them field experience in a, a natural resource management challenge and really got a, a lot of ground covered uh, with, with that combination of some you know, training of some of these you know, interested students and you know, quality control by, by the field staff. The county has continued to, to go down and implement some of their priorities. One of the places they treated is Bay Wetland Sanctuary, where there's a good bit of ash around the edge, um, and their priority communities. So this is just a, a summary of what we've been able to do. I think in the, the grant, we looked to have at least three communities inventory and three volunteer based inventories and we were able to go well beyond that this includes some of the work in our, our, our next grant one of the other things i wanted to, to mention was howard county it's one of our really developed counties in in the baltimore washington border has a pretty significant uh, local government uh, staff and capability. Uh, they heard that, you know, they went to the workshop, got, got the wake up call and really, you know, took, took a lot of initiative um, in going out and identifying where they had ash and, and taking steps. They've had a very aggressive uh, treatment program and a removal and replacement program. They've been experimenting with underplanting in some of their riparian areas. A lot of these, these kinds of issues, there's a lot of invasive issues. Uh, and so we're, they're, they're really leading the way in a lot of way. And we're trying to you know, make sure we continue to coordinate with them and learn from what they do. And, uh, you know, because you know, particularly for invasive species, some of the, the strategies really have to vary across the wide variety of conditions in our state and this this is something where we're all trying to, to learn together and so Howard County is one of the places where they've really been able to make, make some progress while they had and if they hadn't had you know the information you know ahead of time they wouldn't have these options now one of the the last things in, in our completed work was this decision flow chart for our rural forest landowners that helps our foresters work through what are the good good options with different conditions. So that's uh, a, a tool we've been using uh, as we uh, do forest stewardship plans with rural landowners. So that moves us to where we're going into the future, and I'll let Colleen talk about that. Okay. Um, so with this uh, next round of funding that we've received from the U.S. Forest Service, um, we're hoping to continue our urban tree inventories and our community planning, um, most likely moving into the northeast part of the state and uh, the eastern shore of Maryland, where um, EAB has just sort of gotten into the area. Um, but we're hoping also to be able to change focus a little bit and look at some of our core green infrastructure. Um, so our forested areas, um, whereas before we've mostly been looking at street trees and our urban parks, um, starting to look at some of our uh, forest stands now. Um, so one of the key components is uh, planning on the Delmarva Peninsula. So that'll be cooperative planning with 
Delaware, and Virginia. Um, we're going to be doing some planning on our protected lands. Um, and by protected lands, um, I'm referring to both our state lands, things like state parks and state forests, um, but also working with uh, private conservation groups like the Nature Conservancy, um, who own some uh, pretty large properties that contain very extensive ash stands, particularly on the Eastern Shore. Um, we're looking into treatment areas and also some alternative management like biocontrol where treatment isn't feasible. Um, continuing our workshops and education, um, as always, just to get the word out, especially on the Eastern Shore where EAB is a new issue. And then uh, continuing with our pilot utilization program. Um, so I'll run through some of the different approaches that we've been using um, or that we're hoping to use for these different focus areas. Um, so first, uh, coordination on the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, so uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, Maryland geography, uh, the Delmarva Peninsula is this strip of land between the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so it's Maryland's eastern shore, Delaware, and then part of Virginia. Um, and as Anne mentioned, Delaware doesn't have EAB yet. Um, they've been doing extensive trapping and they haven't found it yet. Um, so one of the first uh, focus areas that we have on the Eastern Shore is trying to get information out about um, the quarantine to uh, residents on Maryland's Eastern Shore. Um, because EAB is a new issue and Eastern Shore residents haven't had to deal with the quarantine before, we want to make sure that people understand the risks of moving firewood and things like that, since we do share a border with Delaware. Um, we're also hoping to partner with Delaware on um, any kind of outreach events that we can. We've already worked on some on a homeowner workshop in Newark, and we'll be um, looking for some more opportunities to um, share outreach opportunities there. Um, in terms of inventory, uh, we have some key evacuation and emergency routes um, that do span state borders on the Eastern Shore. And so that's going to be one of our inventory priorities um, in the coming year. Um, and we'll be beginning our inventory and also our local and regional response planning this coming summer, 2016, um, now that EAB has made it onto the Eastern Shore. All right. So I sort of pulled riparian areas out as its own, <laughs> as its own approach here, um, because we do have extensive riparian areas on the eastern shore, but we also have uh, concerns in riparian areas on our protected lands and all across the state. Um, this is one of our big concerns um, in the coming years, is how we're going to manage the ash in our floodplains and our riparian areas. Um, so one of the key things that we're looking to do is just to diversify and reinforce uh, our canopy cover with planting in our riparian areas. Um, we're looking at trying to do treatments where feasible, but as Anne mentioned, a lot of these areas, particularly on the Eastern Shore, um, are inundated six to 12 months out of the year. Um, so in a lot of places, treatment is probably not going to be feasible. Um, so in those areas, we're looking to do biocontrol releases. Um, and where possible, we're hoping to maybe uh, treat trees that might be just slightly in more upland areas, in our riparian areas, um, and then do biocontrol releases in the vicinity um, to sort of do some paired management in those areas. Um, a lot of our rare species in Maryland, actually all of them, our riparian species, so our pumpkin, our Carolina, and our black ash are all growing near water. And so uh, we know that we are probably not going to be able to treat and save um, all or most of them. So we are um, working with the Maryland uh, Wildlife and Heritage Service to do seed collection. And they've already been working on seed collection, but we're hoping to do some more of that in the future um, to try and preserve some genetic diversity in the future. Um, and as I mentioned, the Nature Conservancy has some very extensive stands of ash on um, the headwaters of some of the rivers on the eastern shore. And so we're hoping to partner with them to do some ash management in their riparian areas. Um, 
one of the other focus points for this round of the grant is um, protected lands planning. So this map here shows in green our protected lands in Maryland. Um, so some of those are things like state parks and state forests. We also have some national park land in Maryland. Um, we also have uh, county and private protected lands. And so one of the things that we're doing is developing a protected lands plan um, where we outline guidelines for how to best do inventories um, and then also some of the options for how to respond to EAB on protected lands. And we're sort of coming at this from the objective of managing safety risk. So particularly in our state parks, um, we have a lot of high traffic visitor areas um, where if we have a lot of falling ash trees, um, that's gonna pose a serious public safety risk. So uh, we're coming from the perspective of trying to uh, use treatment and um, biocontrol and removal to minimize public safety risk. But at the same time, we know that we have a lot of our rare species and our specimen trees in our protected lands. Um, so trying to get some uh, treatment options and some management options in there to preserve some of those trees as well. Um, we've begun working with the Maryland Park Service and started to um, develop an approach for how we're going to go about managing ash on protected lands. So um, we've been doing inventories around our developed areas at this stage. So that's things like uh, campgrounds or picnic areas, places where we have a lot of visitor activity and where people are kind of staying put. Um, and we're hoping to treat large specimen trees that are going to pose the greatest safety hazard in those areas. Um, but in a lot of places, we're not going to be able to treat all of the trees that we need to. So we're hoping to do some biocontrol releases. So we're looking at where we might have extensive ash stands or rare species, um, or also maybe just some strategically located stands, some corridors of ash, or um, maybe some areas where we've done some treatments and we can do some biocontrol in the vicinity. Um, and then lastly, um, looking at starting to prioritize and begin removals of any hazardous trees that we find in our inventories. So this here is a map of Patapsco Valley State Park, their campground. Uh, one of their campgrounds, actually. Um, Patapsco is one of our biggest state parks in Maryland. It's also one of our busiest. It's located right in between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., um, so they get a lot of visitors. And their campground has about 600 ash trees, in it. and it's not a very large campground, so the ash density is very high. Um, and most of the trees are about 6 to 8 inches DBH, so most of them are not going to be treated um, I did highlight in green the trees that were selected for treatment. Um, but this is one of the areas where we're thinking that biocontrol might be a good option for management. Um, because if we do lose all of the ash in this area, that's going to completely change the character of this campground. Um, and it's also going to place a very heavy burden on the park staff for removing um, dying, dying trees to minimize the safety hazards there. So future directions on protected lands. Um, we are looking at um, doing some replanting and invasive control, particularly in riparian areas to maintain that canopy cover. Um, a lot of our protected lands do run along river valleys. Um, so again, canopy cover is of utmost importance here. Um, the Maryland Park Service um, is going to begin doing some of their response activities using uh, US Forest Service uh, forest health funding, um, where they'll be investing in treatment equipment and developing expertise to be able to do some treatments and continue those into the future. And um, again, we're hoping to work with some private conservation groups. We've begun talking with the Nature Conservancy and we hope to um, develop those partnerships to manage the ash across more of the state. We do have a 50-50 cost share program for treatment um, using the U.S. Forest Service Forest Health Funding, um, and that's for uh, treating trees on public lands. 
And so we're going to be working uh, with about five communities around the state this coming spring. Um, and these are some pictures from the Hagerstown City Park that Anne was mentioning earlier. Um, we worked with them to do some treatments last year. And um, this is just to sort of show uh, really the quality of the ash, um, the safety hazard that it would pose if these ash died, um, and really sort of the benefits that we're hoping to get from doing some of these treatments, and really preserve the benefits that these trees provide. Uh, so we are, um, as I mentioned, continuing, always continuing with our outreach efforts. Um, we do some tree tagging where we do um, either treatments or inventories along streets with lots of ash trees just to get um, some more community awareness. Um, done a lot of presentations at community events. Um, Maryland Department of uh, Agriculture has done a number of press releases. University of Maryland Extension has put on a number of workshops um, to help get the word out uh, to landowners and to communities. Um, Tyler Wakefield, who was in my position before me, put together this um, homeowner guide for how to manage emerald ash borer on um, private property. A lot of the work that we do is on public land, um, so this was a way to get information to homeowners. Um, and this guide sort of goes through how to identify ash trees, how to identify the signs of EAB, um, and sort of assessing the pros and cons of removal or treatment and how to treat most effectively um, so that you don't end up wasting money. Um, and so this has been a really helpful resource for us. Um, we take it to all of our outreach events to, um, to get some information out to homeowners. Um, and then lastly, um, we are continuing with our utilization pilot. Um, we're working to develop the pilot program in Baltimore County. Um, which can then be used as an example around the state. Um, we're in the research phase right now, but the wheels are turning, so we'll be moving ahead with that um, in the coming months. Um, we have some ideas for potential partners with the project. Um, for example, there are some good high school woodworking programs in the area that we might be able to team up with to provide materials. Um, we might be able to work with Habitat for Humanity to provide building materials. Um, there are a number of jurisdictions that we may be able to sort of partner with regionally um, to share equipment. Um, there are also community fuel assistance programs around the state, um, and we may be able to provide some firewood for fuel assistance programs. Um, we've also been able to begin working with the Baltimore Metropolitan Council, who has a disaster woody debris task force. Um, so the Baltimore Metropolitan Council encompasses all of the counties in the Baltimore area, um, which is a good portion of the state. Um, and this task force mostly deals with managing uh, woody debris after large storm events. Um, and so they could be a really great resource for helping to plan, um, uh, you know, where the most effective uh, locations for, uh, for sorting yards and things like that could be. Um, and also how to most effectively use these pilot programs for, for future events, not just for EAB. All right, so um, the question that I get a lot is, uh, you know, what are we really looking at for the future of ash trees in Maryland? Um, and it seems that, you know, the answer to that is still unclear. Um, what we do know is in the short term, we're trying to treat as much as we can um, and prioritize the removals so that we can minimize any safety hazards. Um, and wherever we are doing removals, we're trying to encourage replacement with a diversity of species so that um, our forests are a little more robust to any uh, future pest outbreaks that we might have. Uh, but in the long term, we're really looking at biocontrol um, to promote the, the long-term survival of ash in the landscape. Um, and to decrease our treatment needs over time. Um, and we're also following all of the studies on lingering ash that have been coming out of the lake states. Um, and as 
you know, the initial wave of EAB moves through Maryland, we'll be looking at our forests to see um, what our ash survival rates have been. Um, so hopefully between all of these efforts, um, we can maintain uh, some level of ash in, in the landscape. So this is uh, my contact information. And uh, with that, I guess we have time for some questions. Thank you very much. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, the first question is, uh, you said that you might have been able to eradicate EAB in 2003, but perhaps did not have correct information about the Beatles movement. What other factors contributed to the failed attempt at eradication? Some of the other challenges that we had in eradication is just finding all the ash trees in the landscape. I mean, we were out there, you know, a lot of our staff took turns. We did shifts from all around the state to go and try and mark ash in all of these wetlands around the site. Um, it was it was hard to get all of them. You know, it, sometimes it and sometimes it was the really big ash trees with a little bit different bark texture that they missed. So I would say that physically it's really challenging to get every single ash tree, and particularly in these you know, wetland forested environments. And that's what you have to do to really eradicate it. And then um, we don't really know how far a really hungry bug will fly. You know, we had information on average move movement, which we think was correct, but you know, and, and then there's, well, if you got a really big wind, how far would prevailing winds move those bugs that may be beyond their capacity to fly? So I think it's just, you know, for something that's, that's a small insect that's up in the treetops for a while before you really identify it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging environment to actually do eradication. Okay, thank you. Um, then the next is, Outreach, coordination, information, inventory, planning, all good and fair activities. What about enforcement, particularly moving of firewood? I cannot say that we have a really impressive track record of enforcement. Um, one of our, our challenges uh, is just even being able to get the information out there. Uh, we did mailings, we've been doing mailings every year to, we have, we have licensed tree experts, we license forest product operators in the state, um, you know, and that would include firewood operators where, where they get licensed, and we do have enforcement of those kind of things, a lot of reporting of unlicensed companies. So all those companies have gotten mailings about Emerald Ash Borer, about the quarantine, about what, what rules, what's restricted in its movement. So I think we've we've done that, but in terms of more casual, you know, let's load up some firewood from Aunt Susie's to take to the campground. Um, I don't think that we have had an effective way to reach those. We tried to have uh, a sign posted at the Bay Bridge between Western Maryland and the Eastern Shore, and uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture was not able to receive permission for that because it was considered distracting uh, and might pose a safety hazard to the motorists. So I, I think we have some real challenges uh, in, in, in that kind of enforcement. All right, thank you. Um, could you please review the process for getting cost share for managing ash from the U.S. Forest Service? That was through, um, again, a, a competitive grant process for forest health suppression funding. So I would contact Northeastern Area uh, Forest Health uh, contacts just on, on the website. And uh, generally, I think it would go through you know, either the, the state forestry or Department of Agriculture agency within your state. So when, when we've gotten that award, um, you know, as when we were successful in that, that funding, now, now we're, you know, we, we put out a request for a proposal to say, do you want assistance? You know, we we're going to prioritize people with uh, response plans and who have, a, you know, have the ability to retreat uh, in, in a couple years when it's going to need it. Uh, 
And so we, we had a reasonable response to that, and we're going to able to be able to to, to get more treatment in, in this this very limited window of opportunity. I mean, we're not thinking that biocontrols are going to be able to, uh, you know, even where we release them today, I don't think they're going to be able to affect ash survival. But 10 years from now, when ash populations are at a different level in this area, you know, maybe it will be able to be effective in allowing survival of some of our ash. And we do expect, you know, a, a good print of re-sprouting from species like ash. Okay, um, they're looking for a link for that homeowner's guide. Um, if you if you would want to email that to me, I'll make sure that that's included in the email that I send out to the participants, um, Anne and Colleen. Um, I, and if that's all right, I'll even put it on your state information on the Emerald Dashboard uh, info website as well. Yeah, that that'd be great. Okay. Um, you we have find that. Um, uh, there's a lot of information from other states. Uh, it's acknowledged in there, but you know, we, we we took lots of information wherever we could find it. So thank you to those other states that helped us. <laughs> no use reinventing the wheel on something like this sometimes. <laughs> for sure. Okay. Um, the next one is: although your informational sheet for homeowners conveys the threat from EAB, it does not convey the treatment options visually. How do you convey the treatment options to the public? That's on one of the other pages. We only we only showed you the front page. Okay. It's actually uh, it's like a trifold handout. Uh, so on the back page, it has how to treat. All right. Great. Okay, now it says, what is the budget of the Maryland State ASH program and how does it compare to the overall budget of the, of the Maryland Forest Service? It's so 1% or something. Yeah, so, so what we have in terms of dedicated funding is, is just the, the, the funding from Maryland DNR, or, uh, to Maryland DNR Forest Service from U.S. Forest Service. And that's you know probably a little over a hundred thousand a year, but then if you add the suppression funding in that we just got recently, so it's you know probably twice that. Um, and in, in terms of, yeah, but 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 that's just the the dedicated funding. I mean, one of the things that you know we have to consider in here is the fact that we're using that fund in the context of the rest of our staff and. So every one of our, our uh, field staff members has gotten education and is working on some of these issues as they come across in their jurisdiction. That's not budgeted as a line item, but it is certainly something that we're doing. Um, but if, if we did not have the grant support, it would be difficult to have you know, the, the kind of level of attention, response, and um, assistance to jurisdiction at this really, really critical time when people have options for treating. You know, in a few years, we'll, we'll be past that. So we'll have, probably have some other forest health issues. Kind of never ending, isn't it? <laughs> well, we're uh, in <laughs> all right, um, though that is all the questions I have at this point. Um, if if others would like to um, pose a question, there, uh, Colleen gave her information there, um, and as well, we will have that information when we send out the email afterwards for both Colleen and, and Anne. Um, at this point, I really want to thank everybody for participating. You'll see I have the survey, um, the survey URL here on this page. Unfortunately, it's not live. Um, this, the, one of the kind of misfortunes about using the Zoom webinar pro program, you, it isn't, but I will also be sending you this link in the email that you all will get. But we really appreciate this information, um, as I think I, I told <clears throat> Anne and Colleen before. We, um, with, since I coordinate um, the information on the Emerald Dashboard info website, I get a lot of inquiries about how other areas of the, the country, um, state, uh, cities, you know, um, that kind of thing. Counties are are dealing with Emerald Dashboard. And everyone needs, they're looking at these management, how people have, have looked at it, the management that's necessary, and how it's how well it's gone. So I really appreciate you sharing your information and your experience today. Um, 
And with that, I'm going to just uh, let this stay, uh, the little link here stay up for just uh, another moment or two. And with that, I think I will end the meeting. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.